Hello, I'm Rosemary Barnes. My husband Robert and I are the pastors of the church that is bringing you this program. Our church is Grand Rapids River of Life Ministry. Check us out on the web sometime. Check us out to see whether or not you'd like us as a church home. It is our heart as well to be a home away from home for anybody and everybody that loves the Lord. In other words, anytime you visit doesn't mean we necessarily think you came to join our church, but we love to have people who visit from time to time, as well as those that come literally looking for a church home. Uh, we just love people. So come and join us and sing along with us, learn the word along with us. We're a church that believes in bringing forth the ministry of the people within the church, though sometimes we don't, the preacher doesn't get that much uh, longer time to preach. Sometimes if the saints have a lot prepared uh, to come forth and open pulpit, what they've seen in the word during the week, we just love to hear what God is doing among the people as well. Uh, visit us. You'll find out that we're pretty unique. Now, last week, I hope you heard the lesson last week because um, what I'm starting tonight then is uh, just taken off where I left off. I'll share with you what I did share just in very brief form, but not near the detail I did last week. We're right now the base at this present moment of what I'm teaching is out of Matthew 24 when the disciples asked Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And it's a question we're all curious about. So I've already covered up to um, verse through verse 11 and talking about the things that will happen before he comes, wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, famines, earthquakes, uh, people beginning to persecute Christians, killing Christians, being hated of all nations. We've already uh, covered that and the fact that many will be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. You see where that follows, being hated and uh, being killed for the name of the Lord? Some, you know what? I, I do want to start there instead. Um, actually, it's a verse, two verses before where I was going to start, but I didn't say this in the last program. I'm going to say it in this program. If you've been taught, okay, for instance, it is very true. God is good all the time. He's good at your dying breath. He's good when he gives you a new car. He's good when he heals your sickness. He's good if you get cast into prison for his name's sake and his presence comforts you. He's good in all those ways. If when you say he's good all the time, by that you mean you're not ever going to go to prison for his name's sake. You're not ever going to suffer any hardship or persecution because your concept of God being good does not include those pictures. Then you're going to be in trouble when Christians are hated, which many are right now, and persecuted for the name of the Lord, and then you see some people you know and love who love the Lord get killed or in prison, and then you're offended. You're offended. Remember when the disciples found out that John the Baptist had gotten his head cut off? And Jesus said, Blessed is the man who's not offended in me. In other words, don't let it offend you when somebody gets killed for my name's sake. It's all part of what can happen to any believer. Don't get offended and fall away from Christ. Don't hold this life so dear. The Bible says that the way to overcome the enemy, one way to overcome the enemy is to love not your life unto death. In other words, if you're killed for the sake of the, the gospel on the way out, don't be shocked. Don't be offended. It could happen. But Jesus is saying here, after people are hated, many will betray one another and hate one another. You know what's going to happen? They're going to stand back and say, wait, I don't want to be a part of that. You can die for that. You can get hurt for that. And if somebody comes along and says, are you like those people over there? You know that group of people that's so fanatical that people put them in prison? Oh, no. You'll be like Peter. Oh, no, I don't know them. I don't know those people. They'll, because you're offended. Don't be offended when these times, if you're alive when this happens. And you know what? There's saints right now alive in China, in Sudan, in Egypt, who this is happening to right 
now. So it's not like, oh, off in the distant future, maybe some saints will have to go through this. Some saints are going through it as we speak. Some are in prison as we speak. Some were killed today, yesterday. Some crucified, beheaded, because they switched from, for instance, Islam to Christianity. People, it's happening now. 11, false prophets shall rise and deceive many. People know the word so well that when you hear a teaching, no matter who's saying, oh, this is God, know the word so well, you know how to say, this ain't none of God because the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. Know the voice of the Spirit, know the word. Uh, talk to each person according to what they can handle. A friend could handle how I just said it. Someone else, you might have to tread a little more lightly and speak it with more proof and less um, forthrightness because they want to hear it if you right away say, this ain't none of God, about their favorite prophet. So be careful that you learn how to speak to everybody, but there's going to be a lot of false prophets. And do you think anybody's going to get deceived by a false prophet who doesn't act like a Christian, who doesn't have some prophecies that are right? When I was in the world, I went to a psychic reader. Actually, she called herself a spiritual pastor, but it ended up being a psychic reader. Anyway, you cut it. And you know, you want to know something really odd? Practically everything she told me has happened. The only big problem was, and I said to her, where was she getting her information? She said an Indian was materializing on the wall that she could see that I couldn't see. She didn't say the Spirit of Christ. She didn't say the Holy Spirit of God. She didn't say this is a gift of the Spirit. She said she had an Indian guide. And you know what the enemy wants you to do? You play with a Ouija board sometime, and the same thing can happen. Truth, 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 a lie right in the middle of it. The devil will come as an angel of light and deceive you. And when he's got you, he will add the lies. It only takes a little bit of poison to kill you. Only a little bit of poison to kill you. It's like what I was talking about a couple of minutes ago. If you get the God is good all the time message to a fault, where you get offended when people start dying for the Lord, that poison of nothing bad's going to happen to you. In fact, Jesus is going to come back before anything bad happens to any Christians. That's a lie. Things are, like I said, happening bad to Christians already. But that lie can poison you to where you're not equipped to be able to face tribulation and persecution because you didn't think that would ever happen to a Christian. Wake up. Read the Word. Read the Word. You will find out it has, it is, it will happen to many Christians. And it says here, and this is happening right now too, verse 12, Matthew 24. Question that was posed as an introduction to this chapter by the disciples. What, are the sign of, what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? All these verses are an answer by Jesus to that question. And, he sa and in verse 12, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Iniquity is lawlessness. The word is anomia. Anomia is law, a is apart from. Acting totally apart from the law of God. You see that happening. I am shocked at things Christians allow. Sometimes my husband and I need wake-up calls. We might always see a certain... Uh, person's movies, and then gradually those movies, I'm talking about so-called Christian, those movies start to have a lot of seduction in them or parts being played that you'd never have your daughter play because the costume is just outrageous or the act, the closeness to somebody not, that they're not married to, and if, even if they were, the dress is such, you don't want your daughter in the picture. Just gradually they start to move away, and then we need a wake-up call like, man, now we can't get excited anymore when so-and-so produces a picture or so-and-so has a play because we don't trust him anymore. We've seen one too many times where he took liberty 
way too far, far and it went into lawlessness. There was no need for that. Could have given the illusion of that moment or that story. Chose instead to go on it. I had somebody say to me one time when I was talking on this line, they go, um, well, David and Bathsheba, and thank God um, that in the Bible we, we get the details of sin and the truth and nobody puts their head in the sand. And I said, yeah, and you want your daughter to play Bathsheba in a movie where they depict the exact act specifically in detail? No, God doesn't do that. God will say what David did, but he doesn't get real specific about the details that would turn into a, a porn passage rather than saying David did this thing. She got pregnant. Well, now we all know what, she, what they did because she got pregnant. But who's going to be in a movie that depicts it in detail? Not If I had a daughter, not my daughter, and my son isn't going to play David if I have my way, if they get that detailed. I'm saying lawlessness is like when I talk like this, if you're lawless, your first thought was, that is so judgmental. That is so legalistic. That is just ridiculous. That's reality. We watch reality shows and see everything. That's just how life is. No, you don't have to depict everything in life, especially that which is totally totally lawless to depict and law when we break the ways of god now remember jesus said all the laws fulfilled in love god with all your heart strength and mind and your neighbor is yourself says that all every one of the ten commandments are fulfilled in just those two things and one of the commandments for instance is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife well if your neighbor's wife is prancing all over in a movie with hardly any clothes on looking seductive as all get out it's going to be hard not to covet his wife or mistress or whatever because she's right there like a big hot fudge sunday saying da da so it's not loving to present yourself in such a way where um you do cause somebody to covet you when they can't have you. That's not loving. Anyway, lawlessness makes your heart grow cold. Jesus said that's what's going to happen in the last days. And literally what can happen is when one Christian who's trying their best to hear the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God says, nope, there's a boundary right there, don't go there, don't do that, don't read that, and all of us do miss the mark, those boundaries from time to time. I'm not saying I don't. I'm just saying... If we say to one another, watch out for that because I, don't, I think that's a boundary we cross. There's a whole lot of Christians now that say, we're not under the law. There's grace for forgiveness and you're too uh, strict about all this. No, that attitude, if you give in to it, will cause your heart to grow cold to the things of the Lord. And the Lord is saying many people will experience that. The Lord is the one that said, too, I don't have the verse reference right now, but he said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way to lead to life, and few there be that find it. So if your knee-jerk response to a certain thing a Christian says is wrong is, are you kidding me? Everybody shacks now. All kind of people live together before they get married. How in the world that could that be wrong? So many people are doing. Remember the verse 2. Narrow is the way. Few there be that find it. Most people, because it says narrow and few find it, most people are going to call a whole lot of things good that in fact do not please God. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve him. You do not want your heart to grow cold. Second Thessalonians 2 Verse 3, Paul is addressing the same thing here that Jesus is talking about, the end of the age. And Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. The day that Jesus Christ comes again is the day he's referring to. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. That has to happen first. Falling away. Well, the falling away goes along with what we just read that Jesus said, that the love of many will um, 
wax cold. Many will betray one another. That's part of the falling away, that people draw back. I don't want to be persecuted for being a Christian, and I sure don't have to want to keep a bunch of God's laws while I'm in this earth. You hear people say stupid junk like, you only live once. Now, a Christian saying that is just ridiculous to imply that I live from one to a hundred or whatever. That's stupid. When you're a Christian, you live forever. Well, yeah, that's once, but they're referring to our flesh life here on earth, so you better grab the gusto where you can because you only live once. Baloney, I bet you the devil has deceived more people with that junk instead of our thinking, wait a minute, what do we mean? I, I live forever, and the joy that I'm going to have in eternity with God because I didn't give in to fleshly pleasures that were wicked here is... It's not even to be compared with what I quote-unquote suffer if I say no to my flesh. It's just stupid to do something here that displeases God and risk my heart growing cold and risk pleasures forevermore at the right hand of God because I pleased him while in this life. That's just ignorant. But anyway, many people will fall away and be ignorant. Please don't be one of them. And I say to myself and everybody I love, let's, let's provoke one another if we see each other drawing back in any way, shape, or form. Then it goes on to say, now I've got here, oh, I've got, okay. I had already told you that the word lawlessness means, uh, it's the Greek word anomia, meaning wickedness. Um, okay, I'm going to go on down want to get more clear about who does not inherit the kingdom of God I was just talking about. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Don't be deceived. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know you not, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators. Remember I was talking about people shacking. The Lord's real clear here by his spirit. Fornicators. Fornication is sex outside of marriage. Adultery is one of the people are married. They're both sexual sins. Nor idolaters, you believe in another God. If you're Muslim, you and I do not have the same God. Your God is not Jehovah God with the Son Jesus Christ. I was just reading about the Mormons today. They describe a whole different God. Once a man like us and then grew into godhood that's not the same god as jehovah god who's always been god never been a man as far as father god eternal he wrapped himself up in flesh in christ jesus but even the spirit of christ was before in spirit before he became a man it was god is not a man who became god god is a spirit and those who worship him must worship in church. Idolatry is any time, first of all, we worship another God. And secondly, we put something before God. It becomes an idol to us. And the Bible also said covetousness is idolatry. In other words, if we're materialistic, we're idolaters. The Bible says if that's me, <coughs> I'm not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. goes on to talk about more. Adulterers, I already explained that. Effeminate. You know, that word is kind of fascinating because we realize that homosexuality is an abomination to God and God turns people over to a lie when they practice without repentance homosexuality. But even effeminate is against God. If you have a problem with being, if you're a man and you're effeminate, in other words, you act more like a woman than I do, and you want to dress like a woman, walk like a woman, talk like a woman, that's a problem. God expects men to be men and women to be women. That's his word. I didn't make up that rule. I'm going to say again, as I've said so many times before, there's a lot of people that I love dearly that have been known to be fornicators, homosexual, Thieves, that when they fall into their sin, I pray for them. I visited them in jail. Murderer, think of somebody right now that murdered his son. Love him, visited him often in jail. 
Does that mean I condone what they do? No, it means my heart loves them the way God does. God so loved the world that he died for. So I so love the world, Rosemary, that I want to tell everybody about their ticket out of sin into God's grace and mercy. So I just want you to know that when you talk about Christians hate the ones that do these things, that is not true. We love them as God, and as God loved me when I was in sin, I love the sinner as well and want to see him come to Christ and want to show the love of God. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. All these will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's saying here, Ephesians 5, 6 says, Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon children of disobedience. When people do not uh, follow God, in fact, I'm going to do something. I'm going to turn right now to the Ephesians passage. And I'm still coming from the backdrop of, uh, backdrop of Matthew 24 when it talks about lawlessness. And I just listed some things that were, would not conform to the law of God. Then Ephesians 5 when I said about the don't let anybody deceive you with vain words, the precedent to that in Ephesians 5 uh, with verse 3, fornication, all uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be named once among you as it become a saints, neither filthiness, foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger or unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God. If you're somebody addicted, I knew somebody one time, addicted to prostitutes in Grand Rapids, a person who was struggling with it because he was a believer, but he kept going to the prostitutes. Finally, he literally went into an addiction-related program. And that was years and years ago. And from that day, he's been free of that. So if you are somebody who is what the Bible calls a whoremonger, and you stand in danger of your heart growing cold because of lawlessness, as we read in Matthew 24, there is deliverance in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in his presence, in his spirit, using his word as a weapon against the devil, as Jesus did on the Mount of Temptation. Every time the devil tried to tempt him, it is written, it is written, but you need to know his word. You need to know the armor of the Lord, which I believe is in Ephesians 6. You can read that on your own. Yes, it is. But you don't want to be one that gets offended in Christianity, becomes a lawless person, or deceived by false prophets, especially those false... There's, there's a couple on TV right now. I'm thinking of one. I'm not going to call his name. I'm just going to tell you, watch out for anybody call themselves a Christian teacher and acts like it's okay to sin because the grace and mercy of God is with you all the time and you are the righteousness of Christ in, in Jesus. So even in the midst of your visit to the prostitute, just cry out, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You don't have to repent again. That's the teaching. And I'm saying, yes, you do have to repent. You need to repent to her too and get on out of there. Tell her you're sorry, that you should love her more than to um, want her more physically than you want her salvation to come to bat, come in place. Yeah, you do have to repent, and God will cleanse you with the blood of Jesus, but you need to repent of sin. You will not come into the kingdom of God. And you know what? There's not like all these options of kingdoms to choose from. There's two kingdoms, kingdom of God, kingdom of Satan. Satan hates you. He has in store for you destruction, killing, hurt, pain, hatred. God has an abundant life for you of righteousness, peace, and joy. Only two to choose from. You can get in some false new age cult where you're all going mm, together or whatever and there's wind chimes and the breeze and everybody's sharing their food and everything else and think, oh, love, 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 like I did in San Francisco in 1968. But you know what? Those things turn into hurt and addiction and so-called free sex that becomes bondage and the devil just laughs at you for being such a fool so as to get involved in something that the end thereof is destruction and death. Get in the kingdom of God. Walk according to his 
way. Don't get deceived. Now there'll come a time that there will literally be an antichrist. And I'm going to tell you that he's spoken of, and Dan, you're going to have to read this on your own. I only got a couple minutes left. Um, and the Lord talks about that. He goes on in Matthew 24 to talk about the um, abomination of desolation that was spoken by the prophet Daniel. Now, that's the same thing that Paul was talking about Thessalonians, that the man of sin needs to be revealed. It says over before he comes again. We're talking about when's the time of him coming. In Daniel 11, verse 31, an arm shall stand on his part. This is the part I'm getting to. They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, the temple, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And in Matthew 24, 15, which I need to actually turn right now, Jesus says that has to be fulfilled before he comes back, as well as Thessalonians, like I said. Uh, Paul also said it. He says in 24, 15, And when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. And then he talks about people better flee from Jerusalem at that moment because now the great tribulation is coming. By the way, in 14, just before 15, it says the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached to all nations. So that's going to happen before he comes too. TV really helps with that one. But in 15, now we got that thing Paul says. You got to have a falling away. We already talked about that. Got to have the man of sin in the temple declaring himself to be God. That's what's spoken of here in Daniel 11, 31, and also here in Matthew 24, verse 15. After that, Paul says that has to happen before Jesus comes. Right after that, great tribulation. Then in verse 29, after that, the stars shall fall from the heavens, the power of the earth shall be shaken. And in verse 30, it says, then the Son of Man is going to come in the heavens. So all these things happen before Jesus comes. Then we get caught up to meet him in the air and we'll be with him forever. Matthew 24 says, the one who d endures to the end shall be saved. Endure in Jesus' name. Amen.